here joining us. Thanks, um, and really excited to, uh, for the speakers we have today. Laws are a powerful way to stop animal cruelty in the US, and today we'll be discussing, as the title indicates, how you can support legislation in your own community to protect wild animals from suffering in circuses and in pet stores. Next slide, please. Before we get started, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, I wanna take a moment to introduce you to World Animal Protection. We are a global nonprofit organization and we expose the destructive, exploitative, and cruel systems that cause animal suffering and provide practical and achievable solutions. We've been active since 1950, previously known as the World Society for the Protection of Animals, um, but as of 2014, we are World Animal Protection. We focus on protecting animals in the wild and animals in farming. Next slide. Our mission is to move the world to protect animals. And our vision is a world where animals live free from suffering. So today we have two wonderful speakers uh, for you to hear from. First, we have Liz Cabrera Holtz, a wildlife campaign manager here at World Animal Protection, who will be discussing the retail pet sales ban component of today's webinar. And then we'll hear from Stephanie Harris, Senior Legislative Affairs Manager at Animal Legal Defense Fund, who will be presenting on this circus bans aspect. There will be time at the end of the session for a Q&A with the speakers, uh, but certainly as they present, please feel free to add your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Great. So both of today's speakers will be talking about how you can make big change for animals in your community through passing local legislation. As I mentioned, changing the law is one of the most powerful ways that we can protect animals in the US. And it starts with animal advocates like you fighting to make your communities a kinder place. And local laws don't just protect the animals in your own neighborhood. These laws often ripple outward and eventually lead to changes at the state and federal levels and ultimately protect millions of animals. These local protection laws serve as models for other communities and other jurisdictions that may be interested in protecting animals themselves, and they can drive change at all levels of government. Next slide, thanks. The idea that local legislation spurs bigger change isn't a new one at all, and it does occur across all issues beyond animal protection, but there is recent research demonstrating the positive impact of local, local animal protection legislation specifically on achieving state laws down the road. Analysis by the research organization Faunalytics found evidence supporting the fact that when local laws are adopted by multiple jurisdictions, it does positively influence the creation of state laws later on. This is particularly true when similar laws are passed in several cities or jurisdictions within a state. Uh, Mackenzie has dropped the link to that research in the chat for those who are interested in learning more. Even non-binding local resolutions, which is when a city council, for example, adopts a declaration, and it's not a binding enforceable law, but it does provide the city's position on a topic or issue. These have been found to possibly influence state legislatures as well, because it signals to state policymakers that these are the issues that their communities care about. Next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about the rise of fur bans and how this represents this pattern as well. Um, in 2011, West Hollywood, California became the first city in the US to ban the sale of fur. And that was followed by Berkeley, San Francisco, and then Los Angeles. As this trend suggests, eight years later, the state of California then enacted a statewide fur sales ban, making it illegal anywhere in the state to sell or manufacture new fur products. Following California's role, today six towns and cities in Massachusetts, as well as the cities of Ann Arbor, Michigan, Boulder, Colorado, and Hollandale Beach, Florida, all have fur, fur sales bans in place. And there are at least four state legislators likely to consider similar bills this year, along with communities in 14 states plus Washington, DC. We've seen how these laws impact companies as well. Fashion brands are moving away from selling fur with major brands and stores like Versace, Macy's, Michael Kors, and Chanel adopting fur-free policies as more legislators and consumers clearly say no to fur. 
So with this example, I hope it's clear how powerful local le legislation can be for making wider systemic change for animals. And keeping that in mind, I will pass over to Liz Cabrera Holtz, who will talk about retail pet sales bans. Over to you. Thanks, Cameron. Um, so I'm really excited to speak to everyone today about how retail pet sales bans help animals, especially wild animals, and how you can get involved. This is an issue I'm really passionate about because animals sold in the pet industry are suffering at every step of the way. So animals sold in pet stores are bred in commercial breeding facilities commonly referred to as mills. And in mills, the goal is to produce as many animals as cheaply as possible. Animals are kept in stressful, crowded, unsanitary conditions, and ill and injured animals receive little to no veterinary care. And if animals survive the mill, then they're shipped in crates and boxes to pet stores where they may continue to be neglected. For animals like birds and snakes, um, their suffering might not be over when they reach a human home because they'll likely spend the rest of their lives in tanks and cages that don't come close to the freedom they'd experience in the wild. And on this slide, you'll see some news articles um, and photos describing the conditions at animal mills and some pet stores, both undercover investigations and also um, reports from government inspectors have revealed extreme cruelty, such as animals being frozen to death, um, being denied food and water, and even cannibalism occurring in cages. So last year, we worked with a labor rights group called United for Respect, um, which is organizing and has been organizing with PetSmart workers. Uh, and workers have been speaking out about these unsafe working conditions that are resulting in the neglect and death of animals at PetSmart stores. And some of the photos on your screen are from those workers and were used in this um, vice report. So uh, for example, at the bottom center is Igor, and Igor was a guinea pig at a PetSmart in Tennessee, and a PetSmart employee shared um, that she and her fellow employees had to care for him as he died from an untreated ear infection. And she told Vice, um, which ran an expose on the workers' concerns, that uh, people going into PetSmart should know the company doesn't view pets as animals. They view them as products. Uh, next slide, please. So if you've attended our other webinars on this topic, um, you've seen a similar slide before, but I, before we talk about retail pet sales bans, I, I wanna talk about why banning these sales is so critical. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more in depth about any of these issues, you can watch um, uh, our previous webinars, which Mackenzie will put into the chat. So first, as I just mentioned, animals sold in stores generally come from these large scale breeding operations called mills, um, where many animals suffer. Uh, next, animal sales push more animals into shelters that are already struggling to care for dogs and cats. The MSPCA, which is a really big shelter in Massachusetts, reported that one in four people surrendering a small animal or bird uh, said that they bought them at a pet store. Next, it jeopardizes public health because uh, the wildlife trade is a serious zoonotic disease risk, both for um, established diseases that we're familiar with and emerging ones. And for these well-known diseases like salmonella, um, that's a real problem because reptiles and amphibians kept as companions are a major source of salmonella infection in young children uh, where it can be quite dangerous. Next, it hurts biodiversity. Uh, the wildlife trade, we're talking about one aspect of it in pet stores, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry that's uh, fueling the extinction or decline of numerous species. And the demand for animals for use as companions, um, particularly in the United States, is a major part of that trade. Finally, we believe that wild animals belong in the wild because it's not possible to replicate the freedom they'd experience um, in their wild homes in our homes. You know, birds don't belong in cages and turtles don't belong in tanks, despite what the pet industry is trying to sell us. Next slide, please. So what are retail pet sales bans? Um, these bans, prohibit brick and mortar pet stores from selling animals or certain kinds of animals like puppies. Instead, if, if a city has a retail pet sales ban, pet stores can partner with animal shelters or rescues to um, 
showcase animals in need of adoption, which is really a win-win because customers enjoy seeing animals and the rescue group or shelter um, gets increased visibility. But there are limits to retail pet sales bans. So far, they've only applied to brick and mortar stores, not internet sales. Uh, but we don't like to put in a ceiling on anything when it comes to animals. So, you know, we don't want to rule that out for the future. For example, the California fur sales ban includes online sales of fur products into California, and so did the most recent fur ban passed in Lexington, Massachusetts. Um, next, retail pet sales bans don't have anything to do with breeding or the mills where these animals are produced. Um, it doesn't make breeding illegal, for example, and it doesn't create increased restrictions or standards for breeders. Finally, I just want to note that retail pet sales bans don't have anything to do with transparency, um, meaning like the pet store would be required to post information about where the animal came from or the name of the breeding facility. And I just want to note that because it's a really common tactic from the pet industry when they see a, re a retail pet sales ban to try to convince the legislators to drop the ban and just require the stores post information. But doing that doesn't accomplish much because customers don't know what to do with that information. Um, you know, the name of a facility doesn't mean anything to them. And if you even tried to do your own research, it can be tough to find a lot of relevant information. So retail pet sales bans are just about that final step, shutting down the sale um, from store to customer. So traditionally, retail pet sales bans have only applied to dogs, cats, and sometimes rabbits. Um, we, you do see other species like pot-bellied pigs and guinea pigs. But of the more than 440 cities with retail pet sales bans, it's generally dogs, cats, and sometimes rabbits. And that's also true at the state level. There are state level bans. Um, you might have heard at the end of last year, New York banned the retail sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits. And that was following similar laws in uh, California, Maryland, and Illinois. Plus, Maine and Washington State have banned new pet stores from selling dogs and cats. But if the pet store already existed and the ownership of the store doesn't change, they can keep doing it. And I just want to be clear about that because I've seen some confusion about animal advocates in retail pet sales bans. We have a campaign urging PetSmart and Petco to stop selling animals right now. And I get emails from people who are a little annoyed saying, you're wrong, PetSmart doesn't sell dogs, they promote adoption, or my town already made it illegal to sell animals. So even though we're talking about often birds and turtles and guinea pigs, people immediately think of puppies. And the name is, it's also confusing because it sounds like a complete ban on animal sales, and that's usually not the case. And I just want to, um, excuse me. I just want to note that to be clear about what we're talking about today, it's not to diminish or criticize how important retail pet sales bans are um, when, when they only apply to dogs and cats. Those are really valuable laws, and they've made tremendous strides in the campaign to end puppy mills. We're just talking about a somewhat different issue today, and um, the reality is that existing retail pet sales bans just don't apply to very many animals. In fact, I'm only uh, aware of two that do. So in 2017, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts made history by becoming the first U.S. city to ban the retail sale of almost all animals banning the sale of mammals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and arachnids. And then at the end of 2022, um, DC, Washington DC passed a similar law. Both these ordinances faced opposition from the pet industry. Um, the big pet store chains lobbied hard because these bans, unlike puppy mill bans, actually impact their stores. But ultimately, um, legislators' concerns over the poor conditions in mills where these animals are bred, as well as the impact on shelters, outweighed the pet industry's claims. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that the law in D.C. is the beginning of a kind of sea change about the way we think about the possibilities of retail pet sales bans and uh, will inspire other communities to follow their example. And I hope that this um, really significant victory energizes you to work on the issue uh, like it has with me. So on this slide, you'll see that 
most of the animals being sold in stores today aren't puppies. Um, they're wild animals like birds, reptiles, and amphibians and small mammals like guinea pigs and hamsters. Um, only an estimated uh, 600 stores still sell puppies in the US today. And you can see um, how many stores are still selling other animals. And this isn't a complete list. These are just the biggest chains. Um, I don't know the total number of pet stores that sell any kind of animal in the US, but we do know that the um, these big pet store chains do. So PetSmart and Petco are the two largest chains in North America. Uh, with nearly 3,000 stores in the U.S. alone, plus uh, Mexico and Canada. And they sell small mammals like guinea pigs and hamsters and parakeets and zebra finches, fishes, reptiles, amphibians, insects, arachnids. And then Pet Supplies Plus and Pet Supermarket, which I believe are the next largest chains um, with nearly 800 stores between them, also sell similar kinds of animals. And when we include the non-chain stores or, or stores that you know, may only have a few locations, we're talking about an even broader group of animals. So there are still stores in the U.S. selling uh, animals like monkeys and lemurs and sloths, which I kind of find unbelievable. So this is an article on your screen you'll see about a pet store in Pensacola, Florida that sells these kinds of animals, um, and it happened to include a photo of Arctic fox pups. And I was just struck by that because, you know, this store in the Florida Panhandle is selling Arctic fox pups to people who live in the Florida Panhandle. So the impact of the laws like those in, in D.C. and Cambridge are really hard to overstate. As we saw in the first slide, you know, animals in the pet industry are suffering and they're suffering in high numbers. Uh, but on a more positive note, um, so let's talk about how you can help. If you want to work on a retail pet sales ban in your own community, we have a toolkit to help you. Uh, with the, uh, Mackenzie will put the link in the chat. Thank you. Our toolkit has three parts. First, an overview of the issues surrounding the sale of animals um, in stores. And then next, we talk about the local legislative process. Uh, we included model ordinance language from Cambridge. Um, the toolkit's already a little outdated because it was created prior to the DC law. And you could use take language from either city um, for your own city, or you could expand the number of animals it impacts and include fishes. And then at the end, we have fact sheets that are designed for use with legislators that break down the top reasons we should have retail pet sales bans. Um, so here's just a closer look at the fact sheets. Um, it's a good summary, all these, the titles of the fact sheets, a good summary of why we need these bans. And all of the fact sheets are extensively footnoted. So if um, legislators or community members have questions or concerns, you can point them to the original source for more information. And sorry, um, the second fact sheet covers an issue that I think has really resonated with legislators. At least this was an issue that resonated with legislators in DC, uh, covering where these animals, where animals sold in pet stores come from. And as I said before, virtually all animals, puppies to birds, being sold in pet stores come from these mills. And again, if you wanna hear more about this, you can check out our previous two webinars. Uh, next slide, please. So before I pass it to Steph, I just want to talk about how these bans fit into the larger work to protect wild animals. One of the biggest problems with animals being sold in stores, I think, is that it normalizes something really pernicious and cruel. If you're five years old and you see turtles being sold like leashes at a pet smart, you, you grow up thinking that's normal. You're going to grow up thinking these animals belong in tanks and not in rivers and swamps. You're going to grow up thinking that a bird can have a happy and fulfilling life in a cage that's millions of times smaller than her natural habitat in the wild. But that's just not true as much as people want it to be. You know, turtles and parrots are not adapted to live in our homes. So we need to change the way we think about our relationship to these smaller animals being exploited in the pet trade. You know, much the way we most of us have changed our thinking about the way we relate to non-human primates or big cats. Um, and retail pet sales bans are a really powerful way to do that. So if you have any questions about the toolkit or our campaign in general, um, please reach out to me. Mackenzie's going to put my email in the chat. 
So with that, I'm going to hand it to Steph uh, to discuss circus bands. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, thanks for having me on, both Liz and Cameron. I'm glad to be here today, and I'm a little bit over-caffeinated. Um, again, I'm Stephanie Harris. I'm a Senior Legislative Affairs Manager with the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Our mission is to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system, including by supporting animal protection legislation at the federal, state, and local levels. I also am a resident of Cambridge, Massachusetts, which passed that groundbreaking comprehensive pet store ordinance that Liz was talking about, as well as one of the recent Massachusetts first sales bans. Um, wild animals have complex behavioral, physical, and emotional needs that cannot be satisfied by traveling shows designed for human entertainment. Wild animals used in circuses generally spend their lives in cramped, barren cages or in chains. They're forced to perform unnatural and sometimes painful tricks day in and day out. These animals endure constant stress and are denied the opportunity to engage in natural behaviors. The tricks and stunts that animals used in circuses routinely perform are unnatural. A tiger in the wild would not jump through a ring of fire, nor would an elephant balance on a stool. Animals usually perform tricks out of fear. These stunts are not merely uncomfortable, they're often painful. Uh, they're made, these animals are made to engage in repeated unnatural movements, such as balancing on small objects or on their hind legs, and this can create serious stress on joints and muscles, even leading to permanent injuries and, or, and ailments, especially in captive elephants who often develop osteoarthritis, which is a painful degenerative joint disease. And for elephants in particular, they're typically separated from their mothers at a very young age, raised without adequate enrichment, space, or socialization, perpetually confined in chains and on unnatural surfaces. And this can result in lifelong physiological and psychological damage. Much of the abuse at circuses takes place behind the scenes where, for example, handlers use bull hooks, which is a sharp fireplace poker like device intended to inflict pain and fear. They're used to beat, jab, hook, poke and prod elephants in their most sensitive areas to force them to perform. When the public is present, the mere presence of the bull hook, even a seemingly harmless rubber version of it, acts as a threat of pain the elephant will endure if she doesn't perform as commanded. And this abusive conditioning process often begins when the elephants are mere infants. Similarly, big cats, bears, non-human primates, and other wild animals suffer physically and psychologically in circuses and traveling shows. And this is something that the public has increasingly begun to understand, that these circuses and traveling shows cannot meet the physical and behavioral needs of wild animals. And as a result, animal-based circuses have been dwindling in popularity for decades. As a result of this shifting public opinion, some circuses have closed and others have eliminated have eliminated some or all wild animal acts. In contemporary circuses that dazzle crowds solely with skilled human performers have soared, but there are still far too many circuses traveling in the US that are exploiting wild animals for human entertainment. Next slide, please. Few federal laws protect wild animals forced to live in captivity uh, or in circuses and traveling shows. The Animal Welfare Act is the primary federal law regulating animal exhibitors, including circuses and traveling shows. It requires them to obtain a license. However, the protections under the AWA are meager. Even the U.S. Department of Agriculture's own Inspector General has sharply criticized the agency for failure to both effectively inspect facilities and enforce the AWA. For example, the law does not prohibit the use of controversial bull hooks, or whips, electrical shocks, or other devices that are commonly used in circuses. And it sets low requirements relating to housing, food and sanitation, and only addresses mental stimulation for primates. The USDA is also chronically understaffed. There are around 120 inspectors for the thousands of facilities that are regulated by the AWA. That includes puppy mill zoos and research laboratories as well. So as a result, inspections are conducted infrequently and inspectors often are often inadequately trained to identify signs of abuse and neglect. 
And moreover, the USDA tends to issue warnings or negligible fines or even take no action at all when they do inspect. Most facilities do not lose their licenses. Circuses currently operating in the United States have been cited repeatedly for maintaining animals in filthy conditions, offering soiled or inadequate food, and failing to provide veterinary care, among many other violations. The Endangered Species Act is another federal law that protects wild animals, specifically fish, mammals, and birds, as well as plants listed as threatened or endangered in the U.S. and beyond. Although there have been several cases where the Animal Legal Defense Fund and others have successfully brought lawsuits under the federal ESA regarding facilities not providing proper care to captive wild animals, resulting in animals being transferred to sanctuary, this is not the norm. Next slide, please. Thank you. Strong circus laws at the state and local level are a very effective way to protect captive wild animals. Typically, these circus bans have key provisions that define the scope of covered animals. That may be elephants, non-human primates, big cats and bears. It may be wild animals. It may be all animals except dogs, cats and horses or similar. It defines traveling animal act as well as other key definitions. Importantly, it prohibits the use of those covered animals in such a traveling Animal Act. It exempts non-traveling facilities, those that are non-mobile, permanent, or brick and mortar. And so that includes your, your brick and mortar zoos. It establishes usually civil penalties for violations as well as outlines enforcement authorities. These local laws, however, do not impact roadside zoos or any brick and mortar facilities. They do not address elephant rides or cub petting or photo ops, roadside zoos, or like I said, any brick and mortar facility. They do not establish nor strengthen welfare standards for wild animals used in circuses and traveling shows, nor for any captive wildlife. And they do not increase transparency for circuses and traveling shows or any other entities owning or exhibiting captive wildlife. Wild animals. However, these circus laws do end a community's role in facilitating the abuse of captive wild animals exploited by circuses and traveling shows. And as more and more communities close their doors to these acts, more of these shows will shift to an alternative humane business model. I would encourage anyone who's interested in pursuing a local law to reach out to me and to Liz. Um, we can help provide guidance on recommended language based on what the current gold standard is, as well as the needs of a given jurisdiction, including what other relevant existing state and local laws there may be, what the legislative landscape might look like, potential coalition partners, and more. Other communities may look to yours as a template, so we want to help you craft the strongest local animal protection law possible, one that has a chance of passage and that would not set a weaker precedent, precedent than others. Next slide, please. About 40 countries have banned the use of some or all wild animals in circuses and traveling shows. In 2016, the Ringling Brothers said it would phase out the use of its elephants. Uh, California and Rhode Island both banned the use of bull hooks on elephants. In 27, the year Ringling Brothers decided to shut down, Illinois and New York passed laws banning the use of elephants in circuses and traveling shows. Since then, more states have passed laws to protect wild animals in circuses, including New Jersey, which banned the use of most wild animals in traveling shows, and Hawaii, which banned the import of dangerous wild animals for circuses and other exhibitions. Uh, in 2019, California banned the use of all animals in circuses except for dogs, cats, and horses. In 2021, Colorado banned the use of elephants, big cats, bears, and other animals in circuses and traveling shows. In 2022, Kentucky adopted regulations banning the use of both endangered species in circuses and exotic animals in county fairs, including a ban on elephant rides. Over 150 localities across 37 states have passed various restrictions governing the use of wild animals in circuses and traveling shows. Now even more jurisdictions are considering circus bans. Next slide, please. The protection of animals is a critical issue in its own right. However, in advocating for circus bans, it can be helpful to showcase additional reasons such as protecting public health and safety and 
as well as preempting any red herrings there may be about economic impact. Many traveling shows are ill-equipped to protect public health and safety from wild animals. There have been numerous incidents of animals escaping, injuring, or even killing circus staff or members of the public. Wild animals like big cats and elephants are dangerous and unpredictable. They pose a serious safety risk to the public. Smaller animals like monkeys are also dangerous and they can easily bite visitors who come too close. These companies often rely on collapsible, temporary, and mobile facilities that are unable to consistently contain animals. Additionally, animals can spread parasites or infectious diseases to humans. For example, elephants can carry human tuberculosis, and elephants used in public exhibitions in the United States have actually transferred TB to humans in the past. Importantly, even in communities with circus bands, circuses may operate without animals or using animals that are not covered by the ban. Public pressure and these state and local circus laws are increasing demand for non-animal entertainment. These animal acts are also inherently costly, affecting the profitability of these shows. Even if an exhibitor elects not to operate in a given community, the local spending that would have otherwise accompanied that show in, in the community will be offset by spending on similar amusement activities, meaning families will still spend that money on other amusements. Additionally, that family spending may actually shift from those touring events to resident events and activities, which would lead to a net positive as more or even all of the revenue that is generated is spent locally. Because the market is trending away from the use of wild animal acts, localities are even further insulated against any possible negative impact. Therefore, communities should feel empowered to adopt these surface laws, banning wild animal acts to protect animals, to protect public health and safety without fear of negative impacts. Next slide, please. Until every animal used in entertainment is free of harm, the Animal Legal Defense Fund will keep fighting for better and stronger laws and better and stronger enforcement of those laws. We hope you'll join the Animal Legal Defense Fund and World Animal Protection in pursuing animal protection legislation in your community. Here are some resources from our website, uh, aldf.org, about local circus ordinances in particular. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Liz and Steph. A lot of really important information shared and a lot of great conversation happening in the chat as well. Um, so just appreciate everybody's attention and participation. We are going to shift into the Q&A session of the webinar. Um, and I'll invite Liz and Steph to both turn their cameras back on. Um, again, the Q&A function down at the bottom of your Zoom panel is where you can type in your questions. Uh, we'll also monitor the chat for any questions that pop into the chat as well. Um, but just to, to kick things off um, for really either Liz or Steph, um, for a retail pet sales ban or a circus ban, is this something that any city can pass, any jurisdiction can pass? Um, I can take that uh, at least at first. Um, so no, <laughs> unfortunately, there are some limits on which cities can pass these bans, um, or at least with um, retail pet sales bans, I should say. Um, but I think most cities in most states can. So there are two issues to think about. Um, so first, pet store lobbyists have unfortunately successfully um, lobbied state legislatures, several state legislators to pass what's called a preemption law, which blocks cities and counties rights um, to adopt retail pet sales ban. So when local law conflicts with the state law um, or state law conflicts with federal law, the like the state law preempts or takes over the local law. So the pet store industry convinced Arizona and Ohio to pass laws, making it so cities couldn't pass um, retail pet sales bans um, in those states. And unfortunately, I we're seeing more of these bills being introduced like there's one in Indiana right now um I think I saw one in Kansas um and we're also seeing even broader bills being introduced into state legislatures that would stop municipalities from passing any kind of animal protection bill including circus bans retail pet sales bans fur bans um next 
different states just delegate power to their cities differently. So some some states give less power to cities, and it can be an area of confusion. Even I think it's um, like in Connecticut, there's been um, some concerns about whether a city can pass a retail pet sales ban. So animal advocates have studied the law and believe they can, but not everyone agrees. Um, so as of now, I believe there are no retail pet sales bans in Connecticut. But one thing you can do is check whether another city in your state has a retail pet sales ban. And I realize what I said just sounded very negative, but most, most cities can pass them. So the organization Best Friends has a list on their website of all the bans in the country with links to the ordinance, which I'll look up and put in the chat. So if you see if so if you see a city that has a ban that's in your state, that's a very good sign. But if you don't see um, your state, that doesn't mean it's not possible necessarily. Um, for example, no city in Arkansas had a ban until last year, and now they do. Um, Steph, do you have anything to add? Um, I would just add that I think for the last couple sessions in, in Connecticut, there's been legislation introduced to clarify the law, even though, as you say, many folks believe that it is. Um, that, that the community should be empowered now to pass these local laws um, to clarify that there's been pending state legislation. Thank you both. And thanks, Liz, for putting that link in the chat for anybody who's curious to, to learn more about existing laws that have been passed for the retail pet sales bans. Um, so following on this thread, to just uh, curious if you, either of you or both of you could share a little bit about how difficult it could be to pass an animal protection law at someone's local level, as well as uh, a bit of a follow-up question to that of what are some of the first steps that someone might consider taking? I'm happy to take a first pass at that. Um, so uh, the short answer is it depends on your community. However, often it can be easier to pass something at the local level than at the state level. Um, there are often fewer elected officials that need to be lobbied and potentially more access to them. Um, this can kind of cut way both ways because sometimes when um, your lobbying legislators at the, at the state level, there may be more staff that you can access, but um, it's important to check your, your community's um, legislative process. And usually that information is very available on their website. So you can check your town or city or county's um, government website. And usually the first step is to identify a potential lead sponsor. And so one of the first ways to go about that can be looking at your personal um, city councilor or board of select person. Uh, if you have district specific folks, um, sometimes towns and cities will only have um, at large counselors and select like board members. Um, they can look for someone who represents you specifically. And if uh, Either that isn't the case for your community or that person doesn't seem like a good fit for the um, local legislation that you're interested in pursuing. You can look at um, recent votes that have been taken uh, and see who might be um, particularly interested in the issue, who might be animal friendly, care about uh, public safety or other of these relevant issues. Um, and as you've heard uh, from Cameron and, and from Liz, passing these local laws can help signal the state legislators that this is an issue that the community cares about. So this can help tip the scale in favor of those passing at the state level. Um, Let's see. I think that an important thing to remember when going about approaching um, a local elected official to sponsor legislation, or even if you're further in the process and you're campaigning and you're lobbying those elected officials, is that they're people too, just like us. Um, and, and typically they're in the position they're in because they do care a lot about their community and the concerns of their constituents. And as a constituent, you should feel really empowered to ask them to take action on the things that matter the most to you. And it can be helpful to do a little background research into that elected official, um, look at their website, um, look at their bio that posted, look at their social media, and find some things that you may have in common. That could be either um, other issues they've worked on recently, or maybe it's you went to the same high school, or you have kids that are at the same school. Look for those areas of overlap, and that can be a great way to start building a personal connection with these folks, um, because if you do have a good rapport with them, they're even more likely to take your requests uh, and run with them. 
and I'll just add um, that, yes, yeah, Steph is a master at this, so she's definitely the, the person to go to for advice, but I'll just say generally, I think bringing this issue up, especially the, the broader retail pet sales ban, is important just to signal what, um, you know, you're a constituent, you're a voter about what you care about, and even if it doesn't result in an ordinance, it's still valuable to have these conversations, and you should always be, well, obviously always be respectful and polite, but you don't know what'll happen in a few years, you know, things can move quickly, so even if you feel like your email was ignored or not taken seriously, um, I, I think I, I would just tell you it still it still has value. And if I can just add one more thing, um, if you feel nervous about doing this, one of the best ways to go about it can often be to bring a friend with you. Find someone else in your neighborhood that's also a constituent that can come with you and the two of you can approach that elected official together. Um, often these folks will have um, office hours that are just open to the public. And even if they don't, or if those don't work with your schedule, they'll often be willing to just meet you out for coffee. And you can just sort of use that first meeting to get to know them. Thank you both. Very, very helpful. Um, a couple of issue specific questions then for, for each of you, perhaps first for Liz. Um, in terms of the retail sales of wild animal species, can anyone walk into a store and purchase a wild animal, even a wild animal such as a monkey? Or does somebody have to prove that they are capable, have capacity to take care of the animals before purchasing them? Uh, so generally, no, you can, I mean, it does depend on the animal in the, in the state, but obviously like with a turtle, like you can walk into a pet store and buy a turtle, even if that turtle is going to live for decades and have, you know, complex care needs. Um, you can buy a bird really easily. When you're talking about non-human primates like monkeys, um, first of all, that that is thankfully illegal in some states, but not all states. That's why for the last, um, well, not the last few years, as long as it's been introduced, we've been supporting something called the Captive Primate Safety Act, which would ban the private possession of non-human primates, because unfortunately in some states it's still legal. And then again, it's gonna vary. So in some states, um, yeah, you can just buy a monkey. In other states like Florida, they have like permitting levels and you have to fill out an application. But it's an interesting question because so even in Florida, yes, you have to fill out an application. I think it has like questions you have to prove, like you have to write down, it's like a little book report. You have to write down information, like like how long does monkey live? Like in various things like that. But you can't prove that you can care really for the welfare. You can't provide for the welfare of a lemur in your home. That's not possible. You know, non-human primates are really, most of them are really social animals with complex needs. So on one hand, for certain very few species, yes, there might be some permitting in some states, but really to actually prove you can provide for the welfare, I would say no, um, that's not really happening anywhere. Thanks, Liz. Um, and for, for Steph, I'm kind of combining a few questions that have popped up in the in the chat and the Q&A, um, but in terms of, of addressing non-traveling facilities like roadside zoos and brick and mortar um, operations that use and commodify animals for entertainment and attractions and visitor attractions. Are local ordinances still something that, that can be applied and pursued to um, address that sector in addition to the traveling circuses that you discussed? I haven't seen local laws um, that address brick and mortar facilities um, generally. However, uh, this is where looking at your state laws and your state regulations could be really helpful. Um, there, uh, there may be regulations at the state level that apply to the, um, the, the type of conditions that those animals have to be kept in. And then also, um, depending on your state, your animal cruelty law should apply or animal neglect laws. Um, it depends. Some states actually exempt certain categories of animals from their cruelty laws. Um, but for states that don't exempt wild, captive wild animals from them, um, that is another place to pursue, um, uh, to, to explore. You can reach out to um, your, uh, if, you're, if you're very concerned about the state of the animals, you can reach out to local law enforcement or state law enforcement about the issue. You can look into those laws to make sure that these animals are in fact covered. And if they're not, you can lobby your state legislature to expand um, your cruelty laws to make sure that those animals are covered. And a good way to start with those sorts of inquiries can actually be to reach out to your personal state senator and state representative. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, for what I think will be our final question of the webinar, uh, this webinar and others that we've put on like it certainly serve to educate and inform. And there's a question about what um, World Animal Protection and Animal Legal Defense Fund may be doing to educate kids and young people about these issues and teach them about respecting animals and protecting animals. I'm hoping that maybe both of you can speak to that for your part. Um, so, well, we have, I have to plug our um, our children's activity book. So we have a very sweet um, children's activity book for like, I don't, I don't know exactly, but like elementary school students that has um, coloring pages and games and activities saying why wild animals don't belong in our homes. Um, and I will actually, I'm realizing I don't have the ability to message the chat, but maybe Mackenzie can put that in the, the chat. Um, but that's one thing we're doing. We're not there. And there are organizations that are, you know, they actually are humane education organizations, and that's what they're really focused on. But we definitely are working to infuse that into our work, because one thing we've or I found out in my work over the last two years is that a major driver of this trade is parents who are buying these animals for their children who want who are buying like turtles and birds from pet smarts because their children you know children naturally love animals and that's they don't know how to express it and that seems like a good way to express it um so that's definitely something we want to work on more but if you have any children in your life or um even better if you know any um early childhood or elementary school educators please send them the book I'm excited to see that resource. Um, I am not familiar with it. One of the things I've had the privilege to do in working on local legislation as well as state bills is actually to engage um, local Girl Scout troops, um, Shoots and Roots chapters, um, and other kids that are constituents. And they're some of the best advocates you can find. They're so passionate. They really learn the issue. And they're usually willing to testify at city council hearings or uh, public hearings at the state legislature. So that's been incredible and has helped us see um, some local laws in Massachusetts over the finish line. Um, the Animal Legal Defense Fund has some fantastic resources for um, for young adults. Um, in, particular, in particular, because we're a, um, a legal focused organization. We have a lot of resources available to lock um, but a lot of those would be available whether you're in law school or not. We have a, a vast collection of webinars um, about animal law, including passing animal protection legislation, but we also have resources um, specifically for law students to join existing or start a new animal legal defense fund student chapter, um, to petition for animal law classes if your school doesn't already offer them, um, uh, and that many more um, folks should feel um, uh, should, should feel um, who are interested should should check out our website and the additional resources we have for law students in particular. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's that's really fantastic work and great ideas. And thanks to Mackenzie for dropping the link to the children's activity book in the chat for people to access it. Um, I want to say thanks again to our two speakers, Liz and Steph, and for all of the information that they provided and the helpful answers that they provided as well. I uh, really appreciate everyone who joined us today and listened in live. The recording of this webinar will be shared with all registrants soon as well. Um, and we'd also love to have you join our work. You can download the Retail Pet Sale Band Toolkit, check out our PetSmart and Petco campaigns, or become a World Animal Protection supporter by using the QR code that is uh, on your screen or any of the links in the chat. And again, we'll be sending a, a follow around email to you, a follow email around to you shortly. So just really appreciate your time and your attention and your support. Thank you so much for joining us today.